Greetings, students, and welcome to this episode of The Professor Travel. I am your host, The Professor Travel, coming to you live from Orange County, California. This is the website, the blog, and the podcast that you come to in order to learn more about different travel destinations. This is where you come as a community in order to discuss more. Hopefully, this will inspire you to travel more and ultimately to enjoy life more. Now, we have a lot of different social media sites that you can gain access to us through. Um, obviously, please visit the website at theprofessortravel.com. Uh, we can also be found on both YouTube and Facebook at The Professor Travel. I'm now available on TikTok, if you're there, um, for all my millennials out there. Hey, millennials. Um, <laughs> so you can find me at The Professor Travel over there. Um, if you're an Instagrammer, you can find me. It's a little bit different. It's at the underscore professor underscore travel. If you're on Twitter, you can find me at the professor tr1. And then if you're a blogger, you can find me on theprofessortravel.blogspot.com. Today, my visiting professor is Diana Gould Saltman. Say hi, Diana. Hi there. Thank you so much for visiting us and talking to us about one of your trips that you had taken over the last couple of years. Now, before we get started, can you tell me a little bit about this really wonderful picture of you and your family? <laughs> sure. Well, that's me, the only female in the picture. The <laughs> one in the front is our son. The one right behind me with a beard is my husband, Richard. And the one way back in the back there is a restaurant owner um who does cooking classes this is the last trip that we took as a family um courtesy of my son as a holiday gift to us and it was um valentine's day weekend a three-day weekend so he took us down to mexico city for the weekend he planned everything he made hotel reservations for us and one of the things that he did was he got us this private cooking class with this chef so we did a trip to the mercado um we got to talk to a bunch of the vendors then we brought our produce back to um a home and we all four of us uh, made fresh tortillas and um vegetable mole and a bunch of other things and had dinner together very nice well thank you for sharing that with us it's, it's a great picture of you guys i love it uh, now for the benefit of my students um can you tell us a little bit more about your educational background as well as some uh, international places that you've traveled before sure um well i spent 25 years as a lawyer so i went to law school undergraduate in psychology and um then for the last 10 years i've been a judge at ellis Superior court so none of that qualifies me for travel experience at all, but I have done a lot of travel, both for work and for fun. Mm -hmm. um, I started traveling internationally in 1988 and have traveled internationally most years since then. Um, so I've been to a number of countries in Europe. I've been to Argentina and Mexico. I've been to Japan, um, and a lot of it is, is for business, and then we add on pleasure on both ends of business meetings. Excellent. And I know um, something else in the future, if you're open to this and you've enjoyed this uh, vlog and podcast, uh, I would love to talk to you more about India and your trip that you did to that as well. So sure. that was just beautiful. Um, but for purposes of this vlog and podcast, you did a Viking River cruise from France and then you ended up in Spain, is that correct? We did, it was um, six years ago, actually including today, six years ago, because it, it was for our 25th anniversary. Today's Happy anniversary. Birthday. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and we took two weeks and the reason that we did the two different things was because this was, this was the great marital compromise. I wanted to have sort of a calm and relaxing trip, which was the Viking part. My husband wanted to do an urban excursion kind of trip. That was the Barcelona part. So we did a week on one and a week on the other and put them together. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that you guys had that time together and it sounds really fascinating. I'm, I'm very eager to learn a lot about this. Um, can you tell me how long in advance did you need to uh, take care of your travel, uh, your travel reservations and everything that went along with that process? Well, for the Viking part, we needed to do it earlier than for the Barcelona part. Barcelona, we were doing on our own, and it was easy, you know, to choose a hotel. If one that we wanted wasn't, you know, was booked, we could choose a different one. But for the Viking one, if you ever go on the Viking um, 
on the Viking website, you'll note that the rooms go fairly quickly. So I probably started the planning on the Viking portion of it about nine months in advance. Okay, that makes sense. A lot of people usually do somewhere between a year and six months. So that's, that sounds like you hit the sweet spot on that one. Yeah. Now, when you were planning this out, did you need to have any um, travel visas, special type of travel medications, or had anything related to um, and any special preparation for yourself in order to be able to go on this trip? Uh, we didn't. Uh, There's no special visa requirements or anything for either France or Spain, um, both of which are in the EU. So if you qualify to come in and out of one of the EU countries, then it was not a problem. Um, the only thing I, I had learned on one prior trip was that um, Bismuth is not allowed in France, so things like Pepto Bismol are not available in France. So oh, Pepto Bismol is your go to when you have the occasional tummy trouble, probably something you should pack on your own so that you have some with you. And I learned that on a prior trip and brought it with me. Don't think I needed it, but just in case. And that's actually good. And that's going to lead us into our next section, which is about the prepacking process. Uh, for a lot of my students, uh, if you are going, especially now in the age of COVID-19, I'm starting to hear from a lot of travel vlogs and cruise vlogs that are out there saying that if you are traveling, um, pack extra medication for yourself and make it somewhere that's very accessible so that if in the event you're delayed, if in the event that you are quarantined in a location where you wouldn't have access to these medications, you want to make sure that you have an ample supply of those things. So thank you very much for bringing that up. It's really important that we talk about that. But speaking about the prepacking process, talk to me, what was what were you prepacking for? What was going to be the weather like? And um, were there any bug issues or anything that you needed to be aware of? Um, no bug issues. We're on a river, so mostly because you're going to have, um, and we were on the Mediterranean for the other part, you're going to have milder climate. So it was not really much of an issue. What I found out was that at the end of the river cruise and where we started our drive to Barcelona, they have these amazing winds called Mistral's. And it turns out that um, those are pretty heavy duty winds. And initially, <laughs> I had planned to get a small car because it wasn't going to be a very long drive. We thought it would be really pretty. It actually cost a lot less to do a one way drive to Barcelona than to fly to Barcelona because you can't fly directly from Marseille to Barcelona. You have to go through either Madrid or Paris. So you're basically going back north up, up the countries. But when it turned out, they said, you know, you might want a little bit heavier car than that because of the wind. We got a little heavier car and I was super glad that we did. So <laughs> that part was definitely something I would not have known and I was really glad to have planned for. Would you have equated those winds to kind of like the Santa Ana winds that we experienced in Southern California? No, they weren't warm winds. They were cool winds, but they were much, much heavier. In a Santa Ana wind in Southern California, it's not going to make it hard for you to drive on a highway. This made it hard for me to drive, even with a heavier car. Okay. Wow. Okay. And then um, any type of sun protection that you brought with you at all? Um, I don't remember whether I did specifically, probably I did because I usually have that, but I, since I, I wear makeup every day and I've got SPF in my makeup, that usually covered it. It wasn't particularly hot or cold. We were there in April, mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty mild season, both on the river and on the Mediterranean. Okay, cool. So let's talk about how you got to the airport. Now, I mean, you live relatively close to LAX, right? I do, within an hour's drive and bad traffic. Okay, so I think you were saying before the before the vlog and podcast that you were actually getting a, a car to take you over there. You weren't going to leave your vehicle over there and have to pay for that, right? Correct. Um, it, because we were going to be gone for two weeks, it made a lot more sense. Also, when we get home after being in the air for 10, 12 hours plus the airport time, the last thing you want to do is drive through LA traffic. So I was very happy. <laughs> get a car service for that. I, I, I feel your pain having come back from Thailand through LAX and having to de deal with like after 25 hours of being in the air, I, it, 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 I can't even imagine how that would have been. It would have been crazy. Um, so speaking of flights though, what was the airline that you decided to go with on your way out for this trip? 
Well, we booked through Viking also. Viking has um, an option for that. You don't have to, you can do Viking and book your own, your own air, but they have really good deals with um, various airlines and, and they time it so that when you arrive, you arrive in plenty of time for them to pick you up, get you to the, the ship and, and all that. So we chose to do that. We had KLM okay. um, and we opted for business class. So it was sort of luxury from the minute we got to the airport at LAX all the way through. Nice, um, nice. We changed planes in Amsterdam. Um, so it was LAX to Amsterdam and then Amsterdam to Lyon where we embarked. What was your downtime in Amsterdam? Do you remember? I don't think it was two hours. It was okay. a really short time, just long enough to, you know, get there, you know, check ourselves through, get to the gate and wait a few minutes for the next flight. I remember back in, I think it was 2009 or 2010, my first trip to Venice and I had a stopover in Munich and it was a nine and a half hour stopover in Munich. So it was like, it didn't meet the qualifications of a short stopover and it didn't meet the qualifications of a date. You're know, like, oh, I could just take the day to stay here. It was, a, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> it was really tough. So um, let's talk also about any pre-vacation destinations. You went on this flight directly from LAX to Amsterdam and then from Amsterdam over to, where was the, where was the yeah. destination? Okay. Um, so in that particular case, you didn't have any pre-vacation cities that you stayed in for a long period of time apart from where you were going to start with, correct? Correct. And Leon, I think you spend the first couple of days. So by the time, you know, we were done taking hours of flights, we checked in, we, we dropped off our bags at the ship. We had a couple of days to chill in Leon. Now, I have a question about that because I know some cruise lines, they do that. It's basically... So you, you have the ability to come and go off and on the ship as best you want. Uh, are you, do they give you like food on the ship? Are you expected to go and do your own food on, like, how does that exactly work? Sure. Well, the way Viking did it, and I don't know about, about other cruise lines, but the way Viking did it is they've arranged the travel. They pick you up at the airport. They usually have it timed so that they have a few passengers arriving at the same time. So you have sort of a nice coach that takes you to the ship. And then depending on when you arrive, um, they have a light lunch available for you. If you aren't, if they aren't ready to check you into your stateroom, you can just drop off your bags and they'll show up in your stateroom when you're ready. Or you can just drop off your bags and go into town for lunch if you want to do that. They then have a time by which they ask everybody to be back so they can do the sort of introduction and um, you know, the safety features and things like that all at once at the same time for everybody. Okay. That sounds great. So it's basically a muster drill is basically what that is, um, where you're having to, you know, know where your, know where your life, muster station is, know where, how to, how the life jackets are put on things like that. Okay. Exactly. Cool. So regardless of whether you're doing that at sea or whether you're doing it at land, it sounds, or, or on a river, it sounds like you're pretty much in the same type of qualifications of safety. It sounds like. Oh, they, they definitely address the safety issues. You know where everybody is, you know who to contact. The only difference being that, you know, if push came to shove, you could swim from the middle of the river to the, to the side of either side and you'd be fine. Yeah, sounds good. Um, now, what was the name of your ship? Do you remember? I don't remember the name of the ship. Okay, but it was definitely a Viking River cruise. It was. Okay. And, they, and they're all long, long ships. So they okay. have... Um, basically a hundred, um, state rooms, so okay. a maximum of 200 people. So talk to me about the accommodations. You get onto the ship. What are your first impressions? Oh, it was beautiful. Um, really clean, really clean lines, a lot of Norwegian wood. Mm -hmm. Um, it looked very sleek and elegant. Um, there's a central area that has sort of a you know, large staircase. We were on the floor, um, the entry floor. Okay. So um, that made it easy. And they have various types of staterooms, a couple of different kinds of, um, of suites. We didn't have a suite. We had a veranda room. So they're all outside staterooms. So everybody has at a minimum, you've got a window or a French balcony, you know, floor to ceiling window or you've got a, a walkout balcony, which is what we have. Okay, fantastic. 
well, it sounds like it was really, any really big surprises while you were in there? Um, no, there were any big surprises in terms of, you know, something that we weren't expecting because there's lots of preparation. There's a lot, you know, they get you all excited about the trip, you know, the countdown begins and they tell you little things about your destinations, little things about, you know, the meals you can expect before you even get there. Excellent. Okay. Now you're in Lyon. Is there, um, are there guest lectures on this ship as you're going along through this process or is it something where it's more geared towards the itinerary de destinations that you're going to? Um, there, there were a couple of times where there were, um, there were talks that were given on the ship, usually at night as we were going down the river. Every day you're in a different port, or almost every day. And when you are, there is a guide or a series of guides that live in that city. Mm. So you don't have somebody leaving the ship to give you a tour. You show up and there are people in each city from Viking that they're gonna give you the tour because they're local and they've grown up there. Excellent. Now, one other thing I had heard about as far as the food on Viking is that it's all brought on at the destinations that you go to. Is that, are you familiar with that? Yeah, I think other than the pantry stuff, you know, the, the flowers and salts and things that they'll start with, um, the food was fresh every day. I mean, when you got off to go on an excursion in the morning, you saw them starting to pack on the new food that they got from the next port. Okay. So everything is super fresh and super delicious. Okay, fantastic. Good. All right. Well, this is the part where I let you kind of take over a little bit. Um, so I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to sit back and let you kind of take me on this journey. And you're talking to me a little bit about the itinerary, what were the cities you went to, and maybe like something that you did at the various different locations that was really memorable to you. Um, okay. Well, we, you can take this trip in either direction. So you can either book it to start in Lyon, as we did, or you can book it to start in Avignon. Um, the, you're going to see the same port cities in either case, and you're going to have the same tours of the various sites in either case. But we started in Lyon, um, which is a fairly large city in the middle of France. Um, and the Viking also does this tour in conjunction with another one that's nearer to Paris. So you can do a little tour of the Paris area and then fly down and do this one as well if you want to do two different rivers. Okay. Um, so Lyon is very historical. Um, we did some of it on our own. We met people over the course of the cruise, even early on, and, and did some sightseeing in town with them. We also did tours as part of planned excursions. And in each of the cities that we were in, there's an excursion that comes with it. You can choose to do it. You can choose not to do it. Um, but there's always at least one that's already part of the deal. Most of them are during the day. Okay. Um, sometimes they're in the afternoon, sometimes they're all day. Um, trying to remember since it's six years ago, everything that we <laughs> did. Um, I remember doing, uh, what, among the things I remember doing uh, was we did a tour of a family owned winery um, and grounds and um, and we had wine tasting there. I remember going to the Valrona Chocolate Factory because mm. the Rhone, which is what we were on, had a little chocolate tasting there. Um, we did a um, tour of the uh, region where they do Chateau Neuf de Pape wines. Um, so we had a winery tour. We had time in a little village, so we got to you know, wander through the village and pick up things on our own and do wine tastings there. And you're kind of hearing a lot of wine. This is wine region, so. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's a really popular activity around that area. Um, but what I, what I hadn't really seen before was there were, there were certainly areas um, where um, Van Gogh had, had painted and where he had lived. And so we saw some of that. I hadn't realized that there were a fairly decent amount of Roman ruins still there. There was sort of a mini Colosseum in one city. We did a tour through that. Okay. Um, and that they're in very good shape. They're very well intact. So for example, a Colosseum that we toured doesn't have, you know, any, you know, 
lions being killed there any longer, but they do rock concerts there mm -hmm. because they still have the seating is still useful and they keep it up and if I can interrupt for just one second, um, for, my, for my viewers, for the students that are out there, um, one thing you'll do, and again, if you actually do a tour of Italy, you'll find that they actually have not only the Colosseum in Rome, but they have Colosseums everywhere. And different Colosseums or auditoriums were for a variety of different reasons. Some, like the one in Rome, were gladiatorial in nature. Others, like the one in uh, Verona, for example, was really more of a... Um, a performance auditorium and that's where they do a lot of plays and different things like that um other ones they do concerts and other ones they had a lot of i mean so they have all these ones that are spattered spattered you know <laughs> talking about gladiatorial events uh that are that are all throughout the region and they're meant primarily for entertainment purposes and that was the purpose initially where these governors would create these auditoriums in order to be able to entertain the masses so if you see one location that happens to have something like this, definitely visit and get a little bit of an idea of what that looks like and how, and what was going on there. Cause it's not always going to be something like gladiatorial arena. It's going to be something like a concert venue, even back from the day, it was a concert venue. So thank you again for sharing that. I'm glad I was able to kind of interject here, but please again, continue. One of the things that I guess I was surprised by because I wasn't expecting it is I sort of thought that when we were in France, we would hear everybody speaking French. And when we were in Spain, we'd hear everybody speaking Spanish. That was not the case. What I heard when we were, um, a lot, the, the people on the ship all speak English, whether they're from you know, the UK or from America, everybody's speaking English uh, and most of the passengers spoke English. But when we were, off ship when we were in the northern cities from the Lyon, which is in the center of, of France, and about halfway down the Rhone before we got to um, Arles and uh, Avignon, it was French. Once we started hitting provincial France, the language more commonly spoken there is one called Provençal. And Provençal has a lot it, it definitely sounds like French, but there are different words that you can tell it's not quite French. And the reason that it came out was that once we got off the ship and we started driving to Barcelona, once we crossed the line into Spain, we were hearing Catalan. And Catalan I was familiar with, I knew it wasn't Spanish. And Barcelona is bilingual. Most of the signs there are both in Catalan and in Spanish. But what I found was that Catalan which is the dialect spoken in Spain, and Provençal, the dialect spoken in France, mm -hmm. sound very similar but with different accents. Can but I they ask sound you, like each other? Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, and this kind of jumps ahead to Barcelona, but when you were there, just because I'm remembering it right off the top, um, when you were there, were, was the was the government of Catalonia uh, trying to separate at that point? It wasn't. That came a few years later, so we followed, we followed that as that was happening. Okay, cool. All right, so back to the cruise. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you were picking up on the, on the dialects as well as the different languages that were being spoken at these different locations. So that Correct. sounds really like a cultural intera interaction that was really cool. What other things did you, that you noticed about this process? Well, the farther south we went until we got to Avignon, which is again a larger, a larger city, was um, that we went from Lyon, which is quite uh, cosmopolitan. As we came south, it became more and more pastoral and bucolic and more like you were out in the countryside. Yeah. So there was a lot of that. That was, that was my part, the relaxing part. Um, I was a little nervous because I'd never been on any kind of cruise. I was a little nervous about whether or not there'd be a lot of rocking or I may have issues with, because I, I, I can't even go to Catalina Island without getting seasick if I don't take something. Yeah, I knew that about you. And I was like, I was wondering how this was, I, I, I mean, for those who are not aware, <laughs> Diana is my sister. And, um, I, you know, for all the time I've known you, I, I know you've had this uh, concern with seasickness. And I wasn't sure if it was like, when I heard that you were going on a river cruise, I was actually quite shocked by that because I was like, I didn't know that you would even consider something like that. Well, it turns out that there was nothing to be concerned about because all I can say is that riding on a river cruise, or at least the one that we did, 
was like gliding on glass. It was, it was like being more like you were ice skating down the river. It was so smooth. Oh. So I could not have worried about that. Okay. That sounds, that sounds like, it sounds like a good introduction for people who are concerned about something like that. And, and, and it could be maybe from a price point perspective, it's not necessarily a good introduction cruise, but at the same time, it's also a good opportunity for people who have, who have that little cruise bug who might want to try and do something like this, but are afraid of having those seasick days or something like that. Right. I think it, a river, I've not been on an ocean cruise, so the comparison's a little different. I will say that the the river cruise, you're not spending a, a lot of time on the ship. You can spend all your meals on the ship if you want, um, and most everybody has breakfast on the ship and dinner on the ship unless you've booked a, an excursion for dinner. Um, but even lunch is always available on the ship, and most people have all three meals on the ship most days. Um, but other than meals, you're pretty much out there. So after breakfast, you, you're on your first excursion going out, you know, touring a museum, touring, you know, a winery, something like that. You come back for lunch, take a little rest. And then there's an afternoon excursion if you want to do that. Do you so remember so how many, I was going to say, do you remember how many stops you had over the, over the seven day period? Um, I think there were probably six or seven. I want to say seven. And each of those had their own excursion associated with them? Every one of them had a different excursion, correct. And that's part and of the package. It is. And the excursions, what I liked about them is, even though there's theoretically 200 of you who could be going, and some people choose to, and some people you know, want to see the town on their own, but even at that, the, the, the groupings are in no more than 10 or 12 people. So for every 10 or 12 people, you've got your own tour guide. Um, and you have people who like to go fast and people who are a little slower. And so you <laughs> can actually ask to go with, you know, I don't want to see 10 sites. Let me see five sites, but let me see them a little slower because I'm not so spunky in my walking or, you know, hey, I want to see as much as I can, you know, put me on the, the express train there. <laughs> I, I have a question for you because uh, when Kevin and I, and for my, for my students, Kevin's my husband. When we go typically on a cruise, sometimes we're gonna, he's obviously much younger than I am. So one of the things I like to do is I'll go on a shorter excursion, maybe a little, something that's a little bit more culturally adaptive. And he might be more of the adventurous type. He might be the one that goes on that zip line or that bungee jumping thing or whatever. And that's, or, or a nine hour excursion or something like that. Um, do they give you those options to do shorter excursions versus longer excursions? I don't know whether they do. Ours didn't, I don't recall ours having that as an option. Okay. Um, basically, unless you're going to something that you can walk to, and, and sometimes we did, something that you would just walk off the ship and right over to the, the thing. Oftentimes we would walk on to, you know, some sort of a transportation, you know, a, a motor coach or something to take us out in the countryside to the winery. Well, if you're at the winery, you're at the winery, you're not going to walk, you know, the 10 miles back to the ship. Yeah. So, so for that, I don't recall. But okay. what I can say is that it generally is an older population. I don't think that was unique to the cruise that we were on. But for river cruises, they tend to be more expensive. So they tend to be people who can afford to go on a little bit more expensive. Um, Expendable income thing. There are no children. Um, so nobody under 18 on any of the cruises. Um, they, you know, you, you can read their brochures and I'll tell you, you know, everything about them, but how they differ. There's no smoking in any of them, no inside state rooms. Um, there's no formal nights. Generally every dinner, you know, if you're wearing, you know, business casual, that's all you'll need for the entire trip. Okay. Cool. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised about the smoking, um, just, to kind of, just because even with the um, ocean cruise liners, they usually have a designated smoking section, uh, maybe at the top or on the side where, it's, where the smoke does not impede anybody. Uh, do you know if anybody was using like electronic cigarettes or how they were able to deal with that type of situation? There's no smoking on any of the ships. So if you're going to be in a port every day, you want to smoke, wait till you get into town, you know, find a place to smoke there, but not on the ships, not in other ships. Okay. 
It makes sense. All right. Um, so you're on your way to Avignon. Um, anything as far as um, <clears throat> the disembarkation process or what that was like? At the end? Yes. Um, it was really well organized. Um, Viking knew everybody's itinerary when they had to, you know, when their, their plane was scheduled. In our case, we had arranged it so that we could, rather than taking the flight at Marseille, which is the nearest large airport at the end of that cruise, um, we would have them take us to the car rental agency at the airport, pick up our car, and then we would drive. And they also, for a small fee, rather than, because the, it was a round trip flight, rather than having us fly back home out of Marseille, they booked us to fly a week later out of Barcelona. Now, this is where you are starting the second leg of your trip. You're going from Marseille, in effect, to Barcelona via car. Correct. Um, Talk to me a little bit about some of the things that you did on this leg of the trip. What were, what were the highlights of whether it was on the way there or in Barcelona for you? Well, the, we, it was only a four hour drive, believe it or not. Oh, so wow. it was a very quick ride to, um, from France to Spain. The scenery was beautiful. You've got the Mediterranean on one side, you've got the Pyrenees on the other side. We stopped for lunch at a little town, you know, it, just as we entered Spain. So that was lovely. And then when we got to Barcelona, I dropped off the car because we were going to be staying in Barcelona and didn't need the car other than for the drive over there. So now, where were you staying in Barcelona? What kind of a place did you end up staying? We stayed at a, there's a chain that's in Spain called the Alma chain. Um, it's sort of, I would say probably something that's a cross between a Four Seasons and a W Hotel. Okay. So this was um, in La Champa okay. area and near, not too far from Las Ramblas, which is the main drag mm -hmm. down the center of the city. Um, it was gorgeous. Um, had a beautiful hotel room um, with a courtyard. Um, they had um, the type of thing where you don't ha you don't get a key. You they get your thumbprint when you check in, and your thumbprint is your key for the rest of the trip. Oh wow, that's impressive! <laughs> I've never stayed at a hotel like that. I've stayed at the ones where you wave your card in front of the door, but I've never actually had one where you have a thumbprint. There's literally no card. They like as they're checking you in, they simply scan your thumb, and that's the only thumb that can get in, other than you know maid service to to your room. And they feed you champagne, or in this case, cava, uh, while they're checking you in. So you know it's all good. That sounds amazing. I'm gonna have to look into this the next time I go there. Um, what were? Do you remember any of the activities that you did in Barcelona over the course of that week? Well, there was eating, and then there was everything in between eating. <laughs> so my, my husband, who is um, sort of the quintessential restaurant finder of the world, can mm -hmm. find us both, and did find us both, the you know, lower end stuff that's like the best dive in the city, and also the you know, multi-course tasting menu, you know, top of the San Pellegrino best 50 restaurants of the world list. And so we got some of, some of both. We did Michelin stars and we did um, some amazing places. That, there was one place that was a deli, probably the best deli in the world, um, tiny, 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 where you entered and it was like the smallest little deli in the world. Um, and then it had a teeny weeny back room and in the teeny weeny back room, it had two sort of large picnic tables and they sat you down there, they started pouring you wine and they just started feeding you food with strangers coming and sitting next to you and chatting. Nice, um, nice. It was amazing. Wow, <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I remember um, when I went to Barcelona, like the food was amazing for me. I mean, between, the tapas and pinchas and the paella. I mean, everything was just spectacular there. And I try to relate to my students, or I try to relate, I'm sorry, to my students that 
the stuff we have here in the United States is, you know, good depending upon where you're at. But then you go to other countries like Italy, Spain, France, and the food that you get there is on another level that I can't even begin to describe in some cases. And I try, I really do try. And it's just, I don't know whether it's the way it's made, if it's just fresher, if it's just curated a little bit differently. It's, it's spectacular. So again, um, it's a food lover's paradise in Spain. It, it is. I, I was back in Spain a few months ago um, in Madrid and Mallorca. Mm -hmm. And as you know, but your students don't, um, I don't eat red meat. I haven't eaten red meat in more than 40 years. They are very, very big on their ham in Spain and specifically mm -hmm. their jamón ibérica, which is apparently quite the specialty. They even have museums about it around Spain. Um, so, you, no matter what, I mean, if you go in place and you say, I'd like a, you know, a cup of coffee and a roll, they want to know how much jamón ibérica you would like with that. You say, I'm only here for a cup of coffee. No, no, not that jamón ibérica. So that was really big. But one of the things that I make it a point to do whenever I travel, and, and I definitely did in Barcelona, which is a, a port city, is to have... I always order the fish that's local because there are fish that you can get, and I do this everywhere I go in the world, that don't travel well. So even if you've had something that purports to be, you know, authentic, you know, such and such fish from Spain, maybe it was flash frozen by the time it got to the United States, and maybe it's pretty good, but it's not the same as the fish that they fished out that morning that you're eating right now. So I try to have the local cuisine whenever I, whenever I travel. Um, I never eat at restaurants that I could eat at their same branch, you know, at home. Mm -hmm. um, because that's part of the enjoyment of travel is to, you know, I want to experience it with all my senses, including my mouth. I get it. I absolutely understand. And I know that there's different people who will travel with different ideas in mind. Uh, like there are some people who do opt for that experience where they want, oh, I want to check out a McDonald's everywhere in the world. And that's fine. That's, 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 that's their, that's their deal. And that's cool. I like what you do because it allows, number one, it allows you to infuse money into the local economy, which is great too. But at the same time, it does give you that little bit of a, of a different perspective of what the food's like. And in fact, I think that kind of piggybacks off of what I said earlier, which is, hey, you know, sometimes you're going to go to places and the food is spectacular. And maybe that's the reason why is that it's not preserved. It's not flash frozen, as you made mention. Um, so you're getting it right there on the spot. And I've gone to even places like train depots in Italy where, you know, you just order a croissant and the croissant is spectacular and it has so, it like it's got chocolate mousse in it or marmalade or something like that that they've just done for you and you're like this is from a train station this is fantastic so um you know it, it always surprises me the things that you can find when you travel abroad and the quality of the food and and items that you can get abroad well one of the things that i find to be true everywhere that i've been is that people show love through food families show love through food and when somebody is hosting you and everywhere I go, I perceive myself to be, you know, I, I'm a guest in their, in their home, in their town, in their city. And I want to be a gracious guest and they want to be a gracious host. And as part of that, they really want you to love their food. So um, I'm, I'm there to experience, you know, their hospitality. And it's fantastic that you do that. So, all right, well, that takes us through Spain, at least through uh, Barcelona, but it sounds like you've definitely gone to a lot of different cities there. And I, I assume that you'll probably go back again in the relative future. Well, eventually I'm, I'm hoping to <laughs> zoom traveling a few times a year internationally. That's awesome. I'll have to join you for something like that. We'll have to coordinate. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about the return process. What do you remember about the return process? How fast was it? What did, what did you think? Uh, well, on the way back, we came through Paris. So we went through De Gaulle. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, I think we went through Orly. I take that back, we went through Orly. Mm -hmm. And we're only there for a couple of hours, but you definitely feel French when you're in an airport in France. Um, 
the airport in Barcelona was actually rather rather small compared to Orly, which is enormous. Um, and sort of like being in a big shopping mall. Um, but it was lovely. The flight was lovely. Um, and when we arrived back in Los Angeles, my recollection is we um, zipped through um, customs. So that was certainly lovely. And that was um, before you had the global entry or anything like that, right? I have global entry and Richard just got it recently. So I don't think we would have gone through global entry then because he didn't have it. And there's yeah. nothing like you know, zipping through and then waiting another hour for your husband. So exactly. I probably would have just gone straight through with him. But I remember it being a very fast process coming back. It might have just been, you know, we came back on a weekday at the right time and it wasn't crowded, but it was um, uneventful, which is exactly the way I <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. So let's talk about some post-vacation thoughts. Talk to me a little bit about the pros of going on a river cruise and specifically on the Rhone. Um, well, the Rhone is gorgeous. It's not as, um, it's not as touristed as the Seine. So you, you don't get that, you know, big, going through a big city on the river thing, you get a going through, you know, lots of, you know, miles and miles, or in this case, kilometers and kilometers of, of flowers sort of trip. So that's beautiful. Um, it's uh, because Viking is all adults, you don't have issues with kids running around and as lovely as children are, you can do that on a different trip. Mm -hmm. um, this is the adult trip. And so that was enjoyable. Um, the lectures and the excursions are, are all intended for um, people who want to learn about the place. So you don't, have, you don't have things like zip line and you don't have casinos and you don't have things you could do in other places. What you have is, you know, you want to learn about a castle. Let me, you know, get a uh, somebody with a, a master's or PhD in history of France who's going to show you this castle sort of thing. So that was enjoyable. We met people who were lovely from all over the place and have stayed in touch with some of them. Okay. Um, yeah. Sounds like a great, sounds like a great adventure, especially for people who really like that cultural experience and really want to go out and meet a bunch of new people. I mean, it sounds, and the history as well as part of that process. It sounds like yeah. a great opportunity. Um, what would be some things that a first time traveler doing something like this should be aware of? Well, I would say the, the Viking river cruises and most river cruises really, because I've compared tend to be older um, patrons. So you're not going to have a lot of, you know, young people on their honeymoon, although we did have one couple, um, <laughs> but they stood out. A lot of the people are, I would say, young retirees, people in their late 50s to early 60s. Mm -hmm. um, so people who want, who had the, the financial ability and the time to enjoy themselves, um, you know, before they had the time, but no longer had the stamina to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, people who, you know, had, you know, were vital. So that was something to be aware of. Um, and it's a smaller ship. So you're, you're not going to have, if you do like to do things like zip line or go to casinos, um, and that sort of thing, that's not this ship. Yeah. Um, you know, this is really for relaxing, although you get plenty of walking in. On the excursions, we were getting, you know, six to eight miles of walking a day off the ship. That strikes me as really the major difference when, people, when we travel abroad is, regardless of where I've been in Europe, whether it's been Amsterdam, whether it's been Rome, you walk a lot. You want to have comfortable shoes. You want to have the ability to and don't be afraid to eat early if that's the case. I oftentimes forego breakfast, but if I know I'm going to a place where I'm going to be doing a ton of walking, I'm going to need the energy. And so that makes perfect sense for me to be able to do something like that. And, and I would say for women who are used to wearing high heels, don't. Don't even bother bringing them because <laughs> you want, you're, you're going to be in streets that are cobblestone. That's, you know, it's cute, but it's also not changed in several hundred years. And so you really need to wear practical shoes, even nice flats if you're going to do dressy is fine. But I, and I'm a high heel wearer, I wouldn't bring them. 
Makes sense. Um, and then finally, any value adds, cost savings, or best practices that you would like to share with the students? Sure. Um, I would say take a look in advance and see if there are any of the uh, optional excursions that look good. And unless you really want to overload yourself, pick one or two, but don't take all of them. It's also quite likely there'll be availability when you're on the ship to choose some. Some might sell out, but we, that wasn't our experience. So if you decide you want to do an excursion to some place you didn't know you were going to want to go ahead of time, you can still do it and it's not a problem. They also have um, certain packages if you're drinkers. Um, beer and wine is served at every meal. There's no extra cost for that. Um, but if you want to have um, you know, extra you know, premium alcohols and things like that, there's a package you can pay in advance for that. Um, so you can do that. And you can choose to tip in advance if you want. Um, or you can, you don't have to tip at all, I suppose. But if you're going to, generally people tip at the end and, and usually tip your um, you know, shuttle drivers and things like that separately. Absolutely. Well, Diana, thank you so very much for doing this for me. I really appreciate it and I appreciate all the information. <clears throat> for my students that are out there, if you have any additional questions that come up later on or you just want to know more about this, send them to me at scott at theprofessortravel.com and I'll throw them out to Diana and uh, see if I can get additional information from you. But I know that you can go onto Viking's website and they, they certainly do have a lot of wonderful information on there. Uh, like you were saying though, Diana, there's also a lot of other different um, river cruises that are out there like AMA waterways and Emerald cruises and um, you know, there's, there's a bunch. So definitely, you know, look for the, look for the experience that you want, whether it's a more economical one, a higher end one, it's totally going to appeal to you and the, the port locations might also. So again, thank you, Diana, for that as well. Now, for my viewers on YouTube, if you want to hit the bell icon at the top of the screen, that'll let you know when new videos are being released. If you haven't already done so, please feel free to subscribe to the channel. I certainly appreciate that. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I very much appreciate that. And if you're li listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please feel free to rate us. We definitely appreciate it. And until the next time, make sure every one of your adventures is a travel adventure. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now.